All right. Thank you so much. How is everybody doing? Have you had a chance to check into the news about the White House signing? So the agreement is signed. So let's talk about business. Um, we're going to talk about IP and access to technology. And I will call this a, a, a lawyer's panel, by the way. But we're going to talk about a lot of different things, including debating among ourselves. And we might even talk about music. So stay tuned. We're going to uh, have some exciting dis uh, discussion as well. I would like to try to be as interactive as possible. So feel free to ask questions. And ideally, I would like to leave at least 60, not 60 minutes, but 30 minutes uh, to the Q&A. I would like to dis, uh, just describe the experience of our uh, distinguished panel. Far to my left is Chachi Lee. Chachi is an American-born citizen, American citizen working in Shenzhen. Uh, I think one of the panelists early on, I think GM, you were saying that Tencent compared to some other company is just peanuts. Uh, but Tencent <laughs> is a gigantic uh, company uh, in the internet, gaming, uh, music, uh, et cetera, industry. Uh, Chachi uh, is in charge of Tencent's International Commercial Legal Center. In that capacity, he is responsible for bringing world-class IP to China uh, through the Tencent platform. Uh, and uh, Chachi, I believe that uh, you, you went to University of Chicago, uh, to, to Washington, sorry, uh, and then UC Berkeley. Uh, and he will tell you a little bit of the story about his personal growth uh, from the American lens. And then, of course, uh, to contribute to this panel, he's going to focus on you know, his views from the Tencent perspective, a big technology <coughs> company perspective Based on uh, regarding the trade war, regarding what is going on. And then we have, of course, Howard Chen. Howard is a partner at Green Botolic and also the co-leader of their China practice. Uh, Howard uh, is one of the most prolific uh, patent litigators uh, representing uh, Chinese and Taiwanese companies, <coughs> litigating in the US court uh, regarding the IP issues. So you will tell stories from the trenches uh, in, in the IP litigation arena. And of course, Mark uh, to my left, uh, is a very well-known China scholar from the legal and technology perspective. Uh, Mark Kang Lee is senior fellow at UC Berkeley Center on Technology and Law. And previously, Mark was a uh, government official with U uh, US PTO and uh, US em embassy in Beijing. And also, you, he spent time uh, as a Microsoft IP attorney. So. Uh, Mark speaks Mandarin, and I, I, I forgot myself, as always. Uh, my name is Yabo Lin. I'm a partner at Sili Austin in Palo Alto, and I do corporate transactions. So I wanted to lay the ground a little bit, and then perhaps each of the panelists could speak maybe five minutes, and then Mark, you're a professor, I give you maybe eight minutes. Okay. Um, okay. Always dangerous. <laughs> exactly. So as you know, uh, in the White House a few hours ago, uh, President Trump and Vice Premier Liu He just signed the phase one agreement. And people said that this agreement is less or more than expected, depending on how you view it. And I think we all agree that this is a good thing. You know, one chapter is behind us, and the second chapter, obviously, is before us. And then President Trump said that he cannot wait to fly to Beijing uh, to start the phase two negotiation uh, this year. Uh, and of course, he, uh, uh, he said that he is a very good friend of President Xi. So uh, we have hope for diplomacy. We have hope for technology diplomacy as well. Uh, but then when you uh, sip tea and then face the reality of business, you realize that actually there is a lot of barriers in, in front of you. So, you know, from a legal perspective, as you know, 
uh, U.S. Department of Treasury just issued the new so-called formal regulations or CFIUS regulations, uh, formalizing or finalizing uh, the regulations on foreign investments into the United States, primarily targeting, of course, China. Uh, that was not in the law, but of course, that is the practical impact of the law. And then uh, Department of Commerce will soon issue its list of so-called critical technologies, which include emerging technologies as well as foundational technologies. And then in the uh, emerging technologies, a lot of what we talk about today will be subject to U.S. export control. Previously, those technologies have been classified as so-called EAR-99. That means they do not need export control license for the you know, engineers to talk to engineers. I think um, Fadi was saying that let the engineers talk to engineers. But then under the new rules, the engineers cannot talk to engineers uh, because talking is exporting. You need a license before you talk. Uh, what technologies would be uh, classified as export control uh, license require? Well, they are primarily including four categories. The first category is called AI and machine learning. That would include neural network, deep learning, computer vision, natural language processing. So basically, you know, what we were talking about today. And then microprocessor, and then quantum computing, uh, uh, sensing uh, technologies and uh, biotechnology and 3D printing. Um, so it's very, very broad. Uh, and people argue that all these restrictions probably would not help in terms of the Chinese, I mean, the, the U.S. national security uh, interests, but actually would create barrier to access to, you know, one of the fast growing market and potentially a, a leader in the market space, that means China, and also um, compromise the U.S. Uh, technology uh, leadership. So the key word is tech, uh, access. And I, I know that uh, when lawyers talk, especially four of us talk, uh, that's kind of dangerous. So uh, hopefully we'll keep you interested, and, and I'm pretty confident that uh, with all the fascinating data, you know, lawyers talking about data, Lawyers talking about music and debating will keep you, uh, keep you motivated to, uh, to, to the end of this panel. Uh, Mark, do you want to get started? Sure. Let me, uh, I guess, go up here. Or oh, there yeah, you, you, you go. Could, okay. So when I was here last year, um, I talked a little bit about how I lived in a parallel universe. Uh, when I spoke to IP lawyers, they said, gee, the IP environment in China is getting better. In fact, in some respects, it's better than the US. And they win cases. And when I speak to trade lawyers, they say, China has never had a good IP system. We're utterly frustrated. We have to impose these sanctions. This is our last effort to have some structural change. Now I feel like, rather than in a parallel universe, I feel like I've been living in an insane asylum, like the King of Hearts, where a war has been going on around me. Because if you look at what's actually been happening in China over the past few years, you'll see it's nowhere reflected in the trade war. There have been good things and bad things, but in general, it's quite different from what you imagine. Next slide. First of all, and it's reflected in the trade agreement, but don't believe the trade agreement when you look at it corresponds to the reality that exists now. Many of the provisions are the reality of March and April of last year, when there were dramatic legislative changes in China involving trade secrets, involving trademarks, uh, involving uh, foreign investment. Uh, and to a degree, the phase one agreement reflects that. Those were all positive things. Not reported in the press, so this may all look like new to you. It isn't. This was nine months old. In fact, what we've lost is nine, 10 months of engagement about how that law is going to be implemented. In fact, we had so much progress that the US, which had brought a WTO case against China about two years ago, suspended the case. We were so happy with what China is doing. So if there was a phase one outcome, it really was last spring. Next slide. In fact, the data overwhelmingly shows that the IP environment in China isn't that bad. Now, I quibble with the data, but for 
for, in order to abide by Yabo's restrictions on how long I'm going to talk, let me just give you the good news. You can ask me about the bad news. In general, the data by a number of scholars says that foreigners win IP cases in China, and there have been recent articles to this. There are articles going back 10 or 15 years. And not only that they win, they win at a higher rate than Chinese, and they win at a higher rate than if they brought IP litigation in their home country. So where's the beef? Next slide. What has happened dramatically is that, um, first of all, IP litigation in China has gone up. It's a, a, by a wide margin the most litigious society in the world for intellectual property litigation in all spaces, patent, trademark, copyright, trade secrets, even plant varieties, which is kind of an obscure right, but actually it is the lead in plant variety litigation. So this is on a, the scale is 3,000 to 15,000 of published cases on the left-hand side in case you, you can't see it. So you see how that data shows a variation. By the way, the reason you see the graph going down at the end of the year is courts don't like to accept cases at the end of the year. They don't like to publish cases. It also drops around Spring Festival. Generally, China uh, innovates and litigates the last third of a year, at least in terms of patent filings. Next slide. So what you also see here, I have to turn around and point this out. Look at what flat lines. This is publishing of IP cases. 2018, January, the middle of the trade war. These are published cases involving Americans. Can you see the number? You can't. It flatlines. China stopped publishing cases involving intellectual property in Americans. In fact, Americans were not discriminated against all foreign related IP cases. We have seen a dramatic decrease in transparency in publication of cases. It doesn't mean adjudication of cases, but if you want an, a window into how foreigners have fared during the pendency of the trade war, we don't have it. By the way, this is nowhere in the phase one trade agreement. I am living in the nut house. Next slide. Another interesting little data point, how the patent office is behaving. Nowhere in the phase one trade agreement. Does the patent office in China treat foreigners fairly or unfairly? This is interesting data. It ends, you can't make out the numbers here, I apologize. 2014, this was done by a student of mine. This is the grant rate for patents from Americans in the semiconductor sector. Do you see what that number is around 2014? We did this last year. Zero, effectively zero. Snowball's chance of hell of getting a semiconductor patent granted in China by 2014. But back in the 1990s, 100% in some cases. What's going on here? Industrial policy, perhaps? We don't know. Is this in the phase one trade agreement? I'm in the nut house. Next slide. This is also interesting, forced technology transfer. What about legitimate technology transfer? Are foreigners, are Americans able to transfer technology? Has Donald Trump improved the environment? And by the way, the phase one agreement has a lot on this. This is a long overdue issue. But let me just point out to you that for computer software and industrial processes, the US census, this is US data, US census classification for patent and technology licenses, the number has consistently been going up to $7.6 billion in 2017. Okay, that's positive, but there's another interesting fact. Next slide. This number is what I want you to look at. This is not published by the census data, uh, but it was made available to me. Uh, mainland China, the percentage of licensing revenue from unrelated companies to American companies. What does that mean? This means when a Qualcomm, uh, an interdigital, uh, a Pfizer, whoever, goes out to a Chinese entity and says, would you please take a license on my patents and my technology, and gets paid for it. This is not a related transaction, which would be when General Electric US goes ahead and licenses to General Electric Shanghai. That's just an intra-corporate transfer. The percentage of unrelated tra transfers went up to 60% for the first time. The majority of transactions of technology to China are to unrelated parties. This is really significant. This means you're able to commercialize your technology now. Before, it was all related party transactions, parent to subsidiary. This is a, a 
break through a number. It's gone, it flipped from 2015, where it was 41%. It's now 61%. That's very hopeful. <clears throat> Can Donald Trump take credit for it? No, because it started shifting before his presidency. Very significant issue. Again, I'm in the nut house. It's positive news. It's nowhere in phase one. In fact, in phase one, they don't even talk about exchanging information on technology transfer, even though nominally we just are concluding a phase one trade war involving forced technology transfer. Next slide. Okay, we've seen investment drop dramatically from China and the US, but actually US to China, it goes up. So again, the world is not quite what the media has been making out. And some of it, much like Tesla and the Bain Capital investment in high-tech sectors. Next slide. On forced technology transfer, which is an is issue that has persisted, if you look at the business surveys, you'll see that even though we have a phase one agreement that reflects some legislative changes, the real problem, which is a problem I alluded to, is operational, not legislative. What is happening on the ground? And that's why, actually, one good part about the phase one agreement is we're going to start talking to China again. Because unless we talk to China and we talk to our companies, we're not really going to know how these IP rights are being monetized. And all the data suggests that this is largely an operational issue from business surveys. Next slide. Another data point that I'm not going to steal uh, Jachi's thunder too much is the increase in commercialization a monetization of IP is not limited to technology. China is now the seventh largest music market. China is also a major motion picture market. All of these are positive signs. Now, granted, they don't equal $600 billion in IP theft that the administration has made out. Okay. Uh, and that's one of my problems with this whole trade war scenario is it's a very diffuse kind of inchoate set of complaints where we haven't looked at individual sectors. As I pointed out, I think there's a real problem in the semiconductor sector. I think there's a real problem in transparency if cases are not being published. I think we're seeing, problem, we're seeing improvements in music and motion pictures and video games that probably need to be reflected in the discussion. Maybe they need to be improved more, but those are positive signs. Um, next slide. Last point, and this is where I just want to come back briefly again to the trade agreement, is one of the things I was expecting out of this agreement, I did these slides last week, was special campaigns. The phase one agreement, you know, it, I would probably give it um, maybe a failing grade as a, as a teacher. I'd give the trade war probably a barely passing grade because we did get a lot out of legislative accomplishments. But in terms of the phase one agreement, it's fairly predictable that the administration went back to some of the tried and true mechanisms of the past. Some of them are okay. One of them that I find problematic is a focus on special campaigns. And there are, I think, four of them in this agreement. Customs, uh, uh, counterfeit medic, uh, medicines and pharmaceuticals, uh, online enforcement, and uh, markets that sell counterfeit goods. Uh, there is so much literature today about how special campaigns make no substantive difference in the long run. Round up the usual suspects, as they said at the end of Casablanca, if you remember Humphrey Bogart saying, let's round up the usual suspects. Uh, and that's basically what special campaigns amount to. And you can see that Professor Dimitrov is now in Tulane, Mirtha at, at Cornell, they had these studies 10 or 15 years ago. They all said this is rapid resolution of a major problem, and it's part of the red face test so that USTR could state with a straight face that the trade agreement was a good one. We have four of them in this agreement. We have nothing on judicial enforcement of a general nature, nothing on the problem with transparency, nothing on the fact that China created a new IP court, uh, uh, really nothing that reflects the structural difference, which I was hoping for in my nut house, that uh, it would be structural in the sense that individuals would be better able to protect their rights with robust civil remedies adequate compensation for infringement that would deter further infringement. Instead, we have this focus on administrative enforcement, criminal campaigns, and other measures. To, so to that extent, the trade war, yeah, we got some good things out of it in terms of legislation. This phase one agreement, perhaps old wine in a new bottle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Howard, do you have any uh, overview? Well, I can't have slides. I don't have slides. Uh, but uh, several months ago, Mark and I were on a panel together with Judge 
uh, former Chief Judge Rader from the Patent Court. And I compare, uh, I was born in Shanghai, so I probably have more Chinese perspective than, uh, than my co-panelist uh, in that panel in Stanford. And I said, I compare this with opium war. And uh, Judge Rader disagreed with me. And, uh, <laughs> but he remembered 1848 <laughs> as a year. What I said was, I, I want to repeat today, which is, do you think the British, when they try to sell opium to China, did they think about IP? Did they think about how to protect the technology to extract opium and sales channels, brand values, right? So to that end, uh, I always joke with the Chinese counterparts of my clients or government officials. I said, I compliment what China have done so far. For the, since Ming Dynasty, the dynasty have made a clear decision. No boat can go out to the ocean to trade with the foreigners. When it comes to the Qin Dynasty, the door was bro uh, bro uh, broken open by the British. And the military power, the technology, was protecting the trade. But what the people don't focus on is the 100 years after or 200 years after. The societal change of China is significant. It's not just about one little thing about IP, you know, how much money, how much. Nobody remembers really how much Chinese paid in dollar amounts out of all these uh, sequential uh, five uh, agreements with foreigners. But what people saw in the history, and we will see in the next 50, 100 years, is what societal change to Chinese. And I think that's very significant. And I, this trade war right now with a truce signed today, um, it's not a, that significant to me, honestly. What I think Mark mentioned a point, which is a lot of things has not, was negotiated for infrastructure change, societal change. It's probably no longer being discussed or it's still being negotiated. Because I think, I read some, I, I just don't remember who wrote it, but I, I think from one of the New York Times writers, he said, well, you cannot run away our reality American culture and yourself. And you put these three elements against this set of facts today. From an American perspective, we cannot run away from a reality. We have an empire falling slowly from the World War II times, from our glorious days. We cannot run away from American culture. We have a system. We have a freedom system. We have a great system of the world. We want to sell that to the world. Therefore, we can sell products. Number three, we cannot run away from ourselves because we are Americans. We have our set of value system. If you take your turn around and look at a Chinese perspective, they cannot run away from reality neither. They have so many people to feed. They have so many people they want to keep employed. And, uh, and Americans are already in their life. So they cannot change the reality. They cannot change the American culture. Everybody drinks Coke, everybody listens to American music, everybody uh, watches NBA games. Nothing can be changed on that. The governing power has to worry about them. They cannot run away from themselves. They were, whatever their theory is, they were in power for so long. They cannot give up to a democratic system like ours overnight. What we have recently saw the election in Taiwan was a very subtle and a complicated fight between these two systems. To, uh, very complicated, but, but it, it represents what I said, three elements. No one can run from reality, themselves, and American culture. So the question to me is this trade war, how far it will push the American culture, American value system, and infrastructure elements into the reality of China? And that is more important than how many billion dollars they're going to buy agriculture product, how many, anyway, it, it, effectively, you know, China made money. I, I joke in private that um, back in 1990s, when I was a semiconductor engineer in AMD, I remember we were designing to go to China to set up our first fab. No one worries about IP. No one worries about anything. Right? It was simply a market, cheaper labor. You know, they would never surpass us. We would never have to worry about all this stuff. Um, but today, we worry about everything. We worry about everything. So the ultimate question is, what do we want China to be? You know, if you go back 100 years, we can take our military power and just go have enter into a war with China. But today, after World War II, I think the American-controlled world order or American-designed world order try to avoid human disasters. 
So therefore, we have this more peaceful way to deal with those the WTOs, all the international organizations. But this trade war, I think it's only the beginning of the next 50 years of significant societal change of China. People in China are different from government of China. Individuals, private enterprises of China are different from the American enterprises. What do we Americans want China to be? That is very much at the heart of this whole dispute. Thank you, Howard. Uh, we'll maybe have you talk more about patent litigation stories, but uh, Chachi, do you want to? Uh, I just saw the text of the phase one agreement, so I can't comment too much about it. Um, but I guess I would like to say that I come from a much simpler per perspective. I'm a much simpler person. Um, you know, I, I think when I hear discussions about the trade war, there's, you know, there's talks about uh, kind of a zero-sum game or Thucydides trap or AI or technology. You know, it's a competition, but I, I see it, um, I guess, in much simpler terms. Uh, the company I work for, Tencent, uh, we, we spend billions of dollars every year. Uh, to Howard's point, licensing U.S. created content and showing it to people in China. And so, uh, you know, the number of views that the American TV shows had uh, just on our platform alone in 2019 was over a billion views, right? Uh, same thing with U.S. movies. And so I think, you know, when we think about, you know, great power dynamics and all these kind of, you know, much, uh, you know, national level things, um, I also think about just there's a lot of shared humanity, uh, you know, People love funny shows. They, they love, they want to watch The Avengers. Uh, you know, uh, superhero movies, no matter how silly they are, they're still super, they're very popular. Um, so, you know, when I think about, you know, the power of American uh, culture and soft power in China, uh, American products, they're still much, very much beloved and, uh, and uh, sought after. And I think there's still a, you know, it's not just about money and market, but it's also uh, mind share. People, you know, if you ask about Iron Man and Hulk and Spider-Man in China, almost every single kid knows who those characters are, and it's, and it's part of who they are and, and what they grew up with. So I do, I, I do see, you know, it, kind of there is this collaboration back and forth, and, um, uh, and I don't see it necessarily as a, as a winner take all. I do think there are things flowing kind of both ways. Yeah, Chachi, uh, to continue on that, can you elaborate a little bit in terms of, you know, in 2011, uh, the percentage of the legit music in China was only 1%. Uh, and then now, or two years ago, 94%. Now it's probably even higher. What has caused that to, to shift? Sure. I mean, I, you know, I think I'd like to just introduce myself a little bit. My name is Cha Chin. Unlike the other esteemed uh, panelists, uh, I, I don't have deep expertise in you know, law of the studies or you know, a partner to law firm. You know, my, I think I'm here because uh, I joined a company called Tencent a long time ago, uh, about nine years ago. And uh, back then, the legal department was about 30 people. Now it's about 400 people. And the market cap has grown by about 20 or 25 times, something, something a lot. Um, and in that time there, I was able to maybe go back to the slide before. Um, I was able to work on a lot of the international matters. So I'm hoping I'm, I can come here and kind of share some of my experience. And when we talk about kind of all these big issues, maybe I can provide a little bit of uh, context and detail. And so, you know, uh, w one of the, I hear from a lot of uh, Americans, that they, you know, when they think about IP in China, they just, they just kind of laugh, They're like, doesn't exist, right? IP in China, what's that, right? Um, but, but I'd like to tell you a story about music in China. Um, and I think that the facts, this is from the IFPI, which is kind of the, the organization that tracks the music industry. Um, as you can see, in 2019, China was the seventh biggest music market in the world. 2017, it was 10th, and 2011, it was non-measurable, right? They estimate in 2011 that the percentage of legitimate music was 1%. Now it's 94%. So, these are the, the measurable facts. And so how did we get there? And that's the story I want to tell. Um, so you know, when I first went to China, which was 2001, which is probably much later than a lot of everyone else in the room, 
you know, it's very easy to just go to the side of the street, buy a little disc for five RMB, or if you're a bad negotiator, maybe 10 RMB, right? A whole bunch of every single CD you can imagine, you just buy a disc, just take it home, it's, you're done, right? Um, or if you're more internet savvy, there's a bunch of sites to download. You know, there used to be an mp3.baidu.com. You literally just search the song into the search engine and find the mp3 and download it. And so that was the state of the music industry for quite a long time, uh, at least in, uh, I'd probably say about 2001 to 2011. It really was the wild, wild west. I think probably about 2011 to maybe 2013, there were more legitimate platforms, um, but it was not... There were platforms I wouldn't say they were completely legitimate, right? More like one platform might license some songs, another platform would license another set of songs, they would just kind of have this detente. Um, but I think there was a, a change in 2014, and this is what I would, what I witnessed, and I'd like to tell you the story, and maybe this will reflect a little bit about, about uh, IP protection and the IP system in China. So uh, I was lucky to be part of it. In 2014, late 2013, a lot of the executives at Tencent started to analyze the music industry. And they understood that if the music industry continued as it was, basically a lot of free music, a lot of pirated music, a lot of illegitimate platforms from free downloads, the market was going to be worth, let's just say, X. But if we were able to clean up the industry, if we were to push users to a subscription model, right, and advertising-based, then the, the entire market could be worth 5X, as an example. And we saw that opportunity and we kind of jumped at it. So uh, in 2014, we signed uh, master distributor agreements with the three major labels, Warner, Sony, and Universal Music. And a master distributor agreement just basically says that um, you know, license us your music and we'll license it to anybody who wants it in China if it's a digital, digital stream. But we would add one additional stipulation. That is, if we licensed you the music, then your platform had to be piracy-free. You could only get the music if you were piracy-free. Um, and this was a, a stipulation across the board. And we had skin in the game because we had to pay a lot of money for these licenses. Um, it was a war of attrition. Uh, we filed hundreds of lawsuits. In the beginning, no one, including our own bosses, you know, I think one of the biggest battles was convincing our own internal teams that this could work, that you could actually clean up music. But it would take time right. and a lot of energy and a lot of money, <laughs> right? Time. Um, and in the beginning, you know, platforms didn't, did not comply. They would maybe pay for a little bit, but not clean it up, or they just wouldn't pay for it. And so there were hundreds of lawsuits. We have a full-time team of 30 IP litigators just <laughs> working on IP enforcement in China. And we filed hundreds of lawsuits. Some of them went all the way up. They were recently uh, recognized by WIPO as landmark cases. Um, I won't name names. Um, but slowly, through this war of attrition, just suing, 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 you know, grinding months, 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 slowly the industry started to turn. Right. I, could say, I could say publicly that we filed hundreds of cases. We saw damages um, in the billions of RMB. Um, and there were you know, administrative actions uh, that, that did help in some, some regards. But I think it was the uh, sustained focus <coughs> and effort of, of an IP enforcement team that was able to turn the market. And not only was there a team, but there was also, you know, it's, uh, the pirates are very savvy, right? Uh, they, they'll, they'll, they'll operate in you know, very small towns and provinces. Or they'll do many strange things to, to, to escape your purview. Um, you know, they might show in certain hours of the day and not other hours of the day. They might sh not show at all in the big cities, but show in a lot in the third or fourth tier cities. We built out a network of uh, IP litigators and working with a network of law firms, third parties, and our own in-house technology to monitor, to uh, capture the evidence, to file the takedown uh, notices, and if eventually to, to go to, a, to, a, to more administrative and, and kind of legal measures. Um, through this very long, 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 long process, uh, you know, this is how we have hit the numbers where uh, you know, 96 percent of uh, music now is uh, 
legitimate. Uh, the, the number of users listening to, to, to music, they li listen to legitimate music. Um, you know, it, it was, um, and I do think, you know, I, th I think I should share that, you know, we've worked with a, we work with a lot of American companies as well in China, and some of them have great legal teams. They've built out their own legal team in China. They have Chinese litigators. They, 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 they know the laws. We work with them extremely well. Um, but there are other uh, companies that, uh, for whatever reasons, you know, they, they don't hire uh, Chinese barred attorneys in China, <coughs> even though IP is a key component of their business. Um, and, then they, and they do have a harder time, or they have to rely on a, a partner. Um, you know, if you rely just on external counsel without your own litigators, it's probably a little, you know, you, you know there, there might be some, you know, may not, it may not be, may not be optimal. Um, so I, I just like to tell this story, you know, of music. It was certainly cleaned up. Um, similar changes happened in other industries, too, across, uh, across China. So video went through a similar transformation. Um, uh, literature, uh, uh, comic books, games, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, and eventually you can see that the music industry, Tencent Music Entertainment, went public on the New York Stock Exchange um, and has a, you know, is doing uh, fairly well. So I'd like to just, you know, say, you know, in our, in our online kind of video streaming platforms, uh, you know, have <coughs> tens of millions of paid subscribers and are similar to Netflix investing in original content, which wouldn't make sense if IP didn't exist in China. So, you know, from my uh, kind of perspective at a company, uh, the market results kind of speak for themselves. Certainly IP does exist, at least in the copyright sense, right? I don't, I'm not saying that everything is perfect or, or that uh, there's, there's no hiccups or there's nothing to, that could be improved. But in general, at least for these <coughs> copyright uh, uh, areas, uh, I do think that the environment in China has improved and is actually um, it's enough to sustain billion-dollar businesses. Yeah, thank you, Chachi, for that nice uh, overview and also commentary. I should also note that the general counsel of Tension uh, is also an American, uh, and also the general counsel of another big internet company in China, e-commerce company in China, uh, Alibaba, is also an American. So uh, just imagine that you know, uh, U.S. Uh, big tech companies <coughs> will hire Chinese citizens being the GCs. Uh, perhaps uh, that would become another security risk. But I will go back to you, Mark. Um, I'm confused. I'm completely lost. So listening to you, listening to Howard and Cha Chi, I got the good news <coughs> that things are changing and things are going in the right direction. But I, I'm very impatient. Uh, in, you know, from the U.S. perspective, you know, China is still forcing a technology transfer. Uh, trade secret misappropriation is rampant. Uh, technology companies <coughs> in China are where they are because they are very good at stealing, uh, you know, trade secrets. Again, this is the U.S. perspective. Assuming that you are the trust advisor of NDRC, National Reform and uh, Development Commission of China, you know, the uh, powerful uh, agency under the state council in charge of reform and mandates, etc. So they go to you and they're sure going to listen to you and will implement your ideas. What would be the top three steps that China should take from a government perspective, not from a private company perspective, so that U.S. concerns can be at least address? Well, I, I think that is a great question. I think Top three. Yeah, sometimes I've thought about what something similar. What would I suggest to the Chinese government? Or the U.S. government has heard my suggestions. They just haven't acted on it. Uh, first of all, if I was talking to the Chinese government, the first thing I would say is don't deliver on what you're asked. Educate. And that doesn't mean going like this to the Americans, because the problem is, and I think we heard a little about this in the last panel, you're dealing to a certain extent at this moment in time with a failure of the WTO, an institutional failure that people don't talk about, which is giving omnibus 
uh, uh, trade negotiators authority over areas where they're not experts. So you had folks like Lighthizer who were negotiating steel tariffs, now negotiating trade secrets and IP theft and patents and pharmaceuticals, et cetera. That is extremely difficult. I never negotiated the trade deficit. I don't know how Mnuchin negotiates intellectual property. Uh, and in order to get some real resolution of this issue, you have to bring experts into the table on both sides. This is a criticism of both sides. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, in that capacity, you go back to the preamble of the TRIPS agreement, which w w the, the phrase that was introduced by the Hong Kong delegation before Hong Kong was returned to China, intellectual property is a private right. And it was there for a reason. Those Hong Kongers knew what they were headed into in 1997. And that is get out of the business of having administrative enforcement. Get out of the business of managing intellectual property. Don't put your fingers on the table uh, on, the, on the scale of justice on, on granting patents. Have a robust civil system with expert judges. China has the expert judges already. Give them a measure of independence and make sure they're transparent to reduce corruption and minimize complaints against about from foreigners. That would be the first thing out there. You, you, the, China is partially the way there, but not fully. The US is not helping. Uh, the, the, and, and going along with that, I think China is actually doing pretty well in some experiments. They have a huge cohort of small and individual inventors. This used to be where we were number one. Think of Thomas Edison, think of Edwin Land, think of Birdseye, all these incredible inventors. China now has a cohort of individual inventors that is bigger than the total number of US applicants at the USPTO in a given year. So they have the capacity to create, really create this momentum for private markets around intellectual property if they were to take their hands off of the scale. That also means pulling back on subsidies, letting the market function for what it is. This is what have been, would have been my response. And there are other correlates to that, like uh, non-aggressive antitrust enforcement. Pushing too far is another way of managing uh, intellectual property. But in general, it all comes down to that. Make it a private property right, which is what it is supposed to be. And that is the response to Donald Trump. When he says structural changes, you say, you're absolutely right. Our courts are going to give robust civil damages. They're going to be transparent. It'll be based on the evidence. It'll be fair. Mm -hmm. How about your thinking, uh, Howard? Uh, you represent Chinese companies and Taiwanese companies in litigating the U.S., sometimes well, I, I, I echo, being the defendants. Yeah, I uh, so Fox. what are the major, major issues you, you know, that they run into, and then you, do you think they should do better respecting you know, intellectual property? Well, I'll give you a couple points. I think, uh, first of all, Echo Box, the most important thing is the legal system, especially the litigation damage side of that, has to be equalized. Otherwise, you will never get the trade deficit problem on IP resolved, right? Because you know, we were, before this session, we were just talking about Microsoft over the 25 years in China have never really sued anybody major to give American government, a negotiator like Mark, to take this case to the government directly. Right? So it's, it's very complicated because I think, but, uh, but uh, you can't address those individual problems. You have to look at the infrastructure. You have to look at the social uh, governmental structure. Now China, I can tell you, um, uh, one of my family relatives, uh, he was uh, sent to Harvard you know, back in 19, early 90s and eventually went back to China to be the IP judge in, in China. They are the first generation government officials sent to America to learn the American IP courts. But now they retired. That generation of people retired. Not much has changed. Uh, I can't say nothing has changed, but uh, in terms of the structure, how much a court will slam on the damages, yeah, they changed, but if you compare to the house price in Shanghai, nothing really changed, mm -hmm. right? So that is something major. That's, I think, the first reaction to this whole oh, government IP, you know, it's not fair, it's not fair there. Number two, I think the problem started from, as I, as I go back to my opium war story, I think it is a world that's out of control by Americans, okay? You went to China and said, oh, it's a great market, those people need my product and sell. And it, they, they didn't expect the Chinese has come up changed, transformed their lifestyle, their technology level so fast. 
Maybe at that time in the 90s, Americans are thinking, well, it may take them 50 years to catch up our, our semiconductor, just a semiconductor part. But today, you know, CFUs come in, block every deal on semiconductor, right? I remember in 1994, to build a fab in, in America was two, two billion on average. And then soon, very soon, we quit building fabs. Why? TSMC in Taiwan was the only one who came make money. Everybody else not making money. But don't forget how Taiwan got to be Taiwan in the semiconductor manufacturing. Because in 1980s, a bunch of Chinese, Chinese Americans went back. Right? There was no suffuse control at the time. There was no scrutiny or regulations by the American government stopping them from setting up semiconductor companies. Now, China, as you were asking, Mark, what would be the suggestion you give? They try to recruit Chinese back to China, right? Obviously, they take technology home. The question is, what did they take? Whether those are legal? And uh, um, how did they use them, right? <laughs> or whether those technology they took and then transformed into products will be defendable by guys like me, right? Those are all very detailed questions. But the, but the Chinese government also played the second role, like this, you know, they played the second role as a national venture capitalist, right? They give <coughs> money. <clears throat> big chunk of money to different people. That's something American government has never done. Right. Now, back in law school, I remember John Adams said in the history, commenting on the accusations by Europeans against Americans stealing European technology. John Adams said, I may remember this wrong, but he said, technology migrates from continent to continent. <laughs> towards the East. That time, you know, we were, we were migrating technology from European to American continent. But the question is, how long is that period of time the barbarians become gentlemen? That's what he's talking about, right? Tencent said the $5 of a 5 RMB yuan knockoff CD cannot sustain my most profitable business. I have to kill it. Right. Right? So the barbarian at the gate eventually become the gentleman in Paris. So, so this is the time we're talking about, the how long this will take. Now, China is moving very fast. It takes very short time to be that way. That's what Tencent is, a living example of that. The question, but the flip side of this, is antitrust. The Mark also touched on. Tencent is doing this. Somebody else is doing this. Alibaba, Alipay, all this are doing this. Now, I handled the case in which um, Various Taiwanese flat panel companies executive, executives uh, were put in prison in America based on antitrust theories. And that is a, one of the biggest DOJ investigations. The total fine was over a billion dollar, right? Taiwan as a technology society was so against the American legal system. Because how can you reach out to grab some executive from Taiwan, put him in prison in America? So will, will, Chinese, will China open their door to let American legal system to reach out to grab a Chinese citizen to put in, put, let's say, put a Huawei's executive into the prison of America? They just did that, right, in another country. But I uh, wanted to uh, go back to you, Chachi. Uh, so uh, I think early on you told me that Tencent spent about $1 billion already on licensing fees in the last couple of years. So again, year. that's another... Uh, indication that uh, the barbarians are becoming gentlemen. Uh, but, but then also, you know, Tencent at the same time is making a lot of investments into a lot of companies beyond your business. So I wonder if the restriction on access to technology would become a problem for your business model. For example, you invested $1 billion into Tesla uh, two years ago, I think. And of course, congratulations on the stock price. Um, so what, what is your view on the government's restrictions today versus what Tencent would like to do as a global company? Yeah. Uh, I think for Tesla, those are publicly available stocks. Right. So, um, I think probably that I'm not the right person to answer this question. I mainly handle the commercial matters. <clears throat> of course, I think you know, from Tencent's perspective, um, and we'd like to work with all types of companies around the world. But right. so hopefully no you know, minimize uh, the, the, the barriers. So I was reminded that uh, our panel discussion, uh, you know, among ourselves is over. We would like to open up for the q and I would like to maybe have about <coughs> 15 minutes 
of discussion through the Q&A. Jim? Well, first off, I never thought a bunch of lawyers could be so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> whenever, Mark, whenever Mark Cohen's on a panel, it's great. Um, <laughs> could I move this out of intellectual property and just talk about law in China today and lawyers in China today? Because Chinese lawyers now have to swear allegiance to the party. All the rights lawyers have been rounded up. My friends who are in law in China are not very happy campers. I think you're right, there's been a lot of progress on IP law, and I, I take that, I'll take that into account, but can we talk about the larger uh, yeah. ecosystem of law in China today? Yeah, I'll, I'll take an initial uh, uh, cut at that. Um, you know, I have periodic discussions, probably a few times a year with Jerry Cohen at NYU, and he always asks me, uh, uh, Mark, how is, how is IP? Jerry has no relationship, by the way. Uh, but uh, he says, how is IP doing in China? Uh, and in the past, particularly in some of the crackdown on rights lawyers, I would say, well, you know, there's good, good progress being made. You know, he says, and he would say, I'm glad to hear there's progress being made somewhere. He always wanted me to give him some note of optimism. And it is true, in general, over the past 10, 15, 20 years, that a lot of the progress in China's civil legal system has begun in this really very small pond of intellectual property. Better judges, experiments in civil justice, uh, specialized judges, uh, specialized courts, uh, preliminary injunctions, uh, reversals of burdens of proof, a whole range of things, punitive damages, all these interesting civil experiments, uh, including transparency, that have had benefits for the overall legal system. That position is harder and harder to maintain in light of what we're seeing in other sectors, uh, in light of uh, crackdowns on lawyers, swearing allegiance to the party, uh, um, in light of uh, problems in human <coughs> rights, in light of problems with NGOs in China. Uh, 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 it, there's still a tension there. I mean, I don't feel that by going to China and talking to IP judges about improving the IP system, I'm selling human rights of my country down the road, but it's a tension. It's not <coughs> resolved. And I, I think many of us and many people in the academic world have decided they don't want to go back to China because of some of these human rights and legal concerns, including some of the issues you mentioned. Uh, I still feel there's room for progress in this space, and it has some potential to influence other areas, although not as much as perhaps even two years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody has anything to add. Howard, do you want to chime in? Or I, I think it's want? getting better because yeah, now Americans are demand a more fair system. The Chinese themselves are demanding uh, channels. Uh, they are now starting using courts to, uh, to, to get the right results, so to speak. So it's a self-driven uh, mechanism. And, uh, no party, no political power can really control every, absolutely everything, right? And a second thing is that the education level of the judges in the, in the legal system are getting better and better. The quality of people, you know, like today in America, you, I, can, I can stand out to say, uh, although people make jokes about lawyers all the time, but the, 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 the quality of judges and the lawyers are very high. So that takes time. So China is getting better in that sense. Now the human rights issue, I go back to my earlier points. You have to deal with the reality, the American culture, and yourself, right? <coughs> so from the governing perspective, I mean, you can't have regime change all the time. You can't bomb the capitals of every other country you don't like. So those are the uh, uh, glitches you always have to deal. You always have to deal. The question, again, is how long you have to deal with this. And you should keep the pressure on and on and on until the American value system, the American culture, American, the good things about American stuff are really selling to the world. Now, there will be, will probably will never be a day that everybody in the world just totally absorbs and accepts everything American. But at least the fairness, the sense of fairness, the, you know, yes, our legal system, our litigation costs a lot of money to do it, but this is so far the most open, fair dispute resolutions mechanism. So that's what China needs eventually. I want to just add one other thing that relates to the trade war. If, if you go back to prior bilateral discussions between the U.S. and China on criminal intellectual property and statements, fact sheets from USTR, whenever they said uh, China will enforce criminal IP consistent with rule of law, that phrase consistent with rule of law, think of me. <laughs> I put that in there. <laughs> 
go to the fact sheet and the outcome on uh, today uh, 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 in the trade war, it is absent. But to me, that is absolutely critical. You try to tell a country to throw its citizens in jail. That is a very difficult thing for a diplomat, and frankly, it, I think it is inappropriate, absent, adequate due process protections and a system that works. And we're back into that right now. And I, I, frankly, I'm embarrassed for my country. We should be saying consistent with due process. Because you know what's going to happen, just like it happened with Randolph Guthrie, if people remember that case, 15, 20 years ago, an American selling counterfeit DVDs in China. We said, ramp up on criminal copyright enforcement. Who was the first person to go to jail? An American. <laughs> it wasn't funny for him. Yeah, second question. Uh, yeah. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, my name is John Walsh. I'm a recent retired uh, uh, neurobiologist uh, from uh, Massachusetts. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm getting it wrong a little bit, but there's a lot of, uh, following what this gentleman said here, that there's this idea that ours is the open society, China's is closed. But I, if I, I go to Best Buy and I say, do you have any Huawei phones? No, we don't have any. But I see there are Apple phone stores all over China. Uh, and the same way with other Chinese brands. If I'm, I know that American movies are shown all over China, as are Indian movies and many other countries. It's very hard to see a Chinese movie here. Even some major <coughs> ones like The Wandering Earth or uh, My People, My Country, very hard to see them. And yet, um, and as a matter of fact, it's hard to see many foreign films in the United States at all. So we're this very open country. And in my discipline, um, uh, the, the scientists who are Chinese are being harassed and intimidated. Now, this is biology. This has nothing to do with national security. Many, ha some have left. Others are uncomfortable. Others don't want to stay. I have a colleague who has a very, prof very good collaboration going on with the University of Nanjing. He's worried about that now. He doesn't give a damn about national security. He wants to do some work that may uh, lead to a cure for asthma. <coughs> There's a kind of arrogance about discussing us as a, the perfect society. And it seems to fall apart when you or you discuss the real specifics of the situation. And uh, I wish we had more of that and a little less patting ourselves on the back. We have a terrible human rights problem in this country, the largest <coughs> prison population. It's a racist problem, black uh, people. We don't have such a good foreign policy. We've been killing millions of people around the world for the last 20 years. If I were the other nations of the world, I wouldn't like to look to the United States as a model. Any comments? Well, I, I'll just, I know this is above I, your pay grade, but... Uh, it's above my pay grade. I, I'm just going to address the openness issue and not, not the uh, geopolitical issues. I, I, I didn't get involved in those when I was a government official. You know, we have the largest trade deficit in world history with China, and it's been going <coughs> on for 15, 20 years. Uh, in large part, with the exception of airplanes, semiconductors, and a few other areas, we supply uh, um, uh, 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 wood products, pulp, uh, 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 soybeans. Uh, we're more or less a developing country to the developed country of China. Uh, the reason uh, that the Chinese uh, permit uh, motion pictures from the U.S. is, well, they only permit them up to a quota. We have no quotas on motion pictures. It's a completely free and open market. If you want to download or listen to a Chinese movie, maybe you have to get it off of a Chinese website, maybe from our colleagues here at Tencent, but it is completely open. The markets are incomparable in terms of access. You want to open up an investment if it's not, particularly in the days before CFIUS, and we can, and I agree with you, there's a little bit of excess going on in the U.S., maybe a lot more than a little bit, but um, in general, uh, 
quite unrestricted. You can open up a business of whatever you want. You can come and learn from our universities. University of California, Berkeley has a position that everything is open. We don't have individuals working on top secret matters <coughs> in the embassy, at least in, in the, in the uh, campus, uh, at least uh, uh, in, the, uh, in general, as far as I know. And that's been the position we've said to the US government along with other universities. This is quite different from Chinese academics who also serve as party officials that are advising high levels of the Chinese government, often on issues like intellectual property. I know that person in particular. He sits down with the Chinese leadership every year and gives <coughs> them a talk on innovation and intellectual property. We don't have a doctrine of techno-nationalism. We are not out there trying to promote our own standards. We don't have five, 10, 15 year plans on science and technology policy and how to regain, uh, re regain our, our, our glory of the past. It is really incomparable in terms of openness of this market, ability to talk freely. We don't punish our students for what they say in class. We don't give them fears when they're overseas that if they say something anti-American, we are gonna lean on them or even worse, <coughs> lean on their, on their children or spouse or family back home. So I, I think that comparison is utterly unfair. But in terms of human rights and other issues, I agree <coughs> we have lots of problems in the US. But on the commercial side, the degree of openness in this market, even now with CFIUS and export controls, is significantly greater than China. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, Slav Hermanovic, UC Berkeley and Tsinghua University. Uh, I want to ask you something that spans previous uh, panel and this panel. Apparently, there are uh, now experiments of using artificial intelligence to adjudicate uh, disputes in courts. Any comments on that? Yeah, the, the I, I, I heard of companies making that kind of software or robots try to replace some legal talents, but I think the days that we will just send a robot at the judge is far and away. Yeah, they, they, I know uh, my colleague Andrea Roth at uh, UC Berkeley has been looking a lot at this issue in the U.S at least under US practice, it implicates all sorts of questions like uh, w w what is the algorithm? Uh, can, can you require them to disclose it? How do you know it's fair? And that's just for the limited purposes of sentencing in a criminal case. You know, it's interesting when you talk about transparency, just to kind of respond to a different question, China has done a lot on transparency in the courts in general. And the reason most Chinese say it hasn't so much to do with rule of law as much as reducing corruption. And to the extent that you publish your cases and make your reasoning well known, and that you insist that judges try loosely to follow other cases, you have the potential for some decrease in corruption. So uh, to the extent that things, uh, a case adjudication or sentencing or damages we follow some well-established principles in law and are consistent with each other, we may be able to help resolve some of the problems that we've identified in the Chinese legal system. That's good. One more question. Yeah, Carl. <clears throat> Just real quick for Chai Chi from Tencent. When you were enforcing your patents or, or your Copy. copyrights, uh, were any of your executives subjected to any extrajudicial threats from the people you were trying to crack down on? A good question. Uh, I'm not a litigator, so I, I don't. Uh, I was not. I was not. I was not personally involved in those litigation cases, um, but I, none that I know of. I think Howard, you could address that question. I think this is very analogous to the Taiwanese case involving the antitrust investigation and the eventual conviction. Well, there are certain laws in this country that can get foreigners over, right? Mm -hmm. Antitrust price fixing case is, is one of them. Right. Uh, but market said it is, it, it is very, you know, it, it is quite a challenge to ask a foreign government to allow you to have a long arm reach to their citizens of this kind. But, but I think, you know, the, that's what I said, this is American legal system. We have, we have legislatures that have enacted those laws very carefully going through all the, uh, the history of arguing the, both sides of the, the stuff. But mm -hmm. let's don't be for, forgotten that um, after World War II, American power is the supreme power of the, of the world. 
So the, in the history of if, uh, as, uh, various laws are in place today, so it has a very much a historical context to look at it. So same thing flipping back to China. You want them to enact new laws to be exactly the same as Americans. It's almost impossible, right? They can change certain things. They can do something, but as, at the heart of their change, one, they don't want regime change. So everything touches on that, they're going to refuse, right? Two, implementation is also a big problem. China is so big, the legal system is so young. And how do you implement those newer laws to be equivalent to the American system? Uh, as I said, point out, the, 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 the legal, legal team of China compared to the legal, legal talents in this country is, is out of balance. So how, how do you, we can't expect an overnight rehaul of the whole legal system, all the people, everything, suddenly become so perfect. And we can't just uh, uh, blame everything on the government. And I think we have to be patient. And there's a time, a long time to go from now. But the, the you know, again, Tencent story about making their own legitimate market. Uh, that it's a very encouraging example that eventually, or in a very short period of time, things will change drastically. I might add something, too, in response to your, your question. First of all, there's a lot of copyright litigation in China. So I don't know what the number is. I think last year, I, I suspect around 250,000 cases or so. So if they started arresting or retaliating against everybody who sued, they'd have to open up several new prisons. So it's, it's, uh, and in fact, you know, we should dispense with some of our stereotypes about litigation risks. There are risks, but they're often not what you think. One of them, uh, I, uh, I think we just heard about, people sue the Chinese government for copyright infringement, <laughs> by the way, and they win. Yeah. You know, so this, this is, and there's actually some copyright trolls who do this as a business, routinely picking up people's copyright interests and suing the Chinese government because content is infringed on websites. Uh, but it is also true that foreigners in particular bear a higher degree of risk in the Chinese legal system. And there are any number of foreigners uh, at this moment who have had their passport taken because of the pendency of a civil case. They have to turn it over to the police. They're not permitted to leave the country. They're technically not under arrest, but good luck with your job if you have to go back to the US or wherever and see your family. We don't know the exact numbers. I've heard of some lawyers who are trying to tabulate that from embassies. I've heard that our own embassy, the US embassy, has not been very forthcoming in giving that kind of data. But the numbers are in the hundreds, if not thousands. And then there are, of course, other people who are, are, who are in jail serving time. I think we have this discussion about diplomats. Almost everybody who has been a former diplomat, like myself, has looked at the Michael Covery case involving the Canadian diplomat and wondered, am I next? For what reason? I think the level of fear and I, uh, that has gone into either former diplomats or even business people said, if I go to China next, will I be able to come out? What assurances can people provide? And I must get about a phone call a week from someone who is concerned about that. That was a concern people did not have two or three years ago. Uh, uh, so you know, whether it's exaggerated or not, I can't tell you. But the perception at the moment is a significant part of the problem that there are risks for using the Chinese legal system. And there are some people, and we don't know the full extent, that are suffering because they have. Yeah, I, have, I hate to say that uh, also the same perception from the Chinese perspective as well. I think the Chinese tech executives are very hesitant to travel to the United For States, too, yeah. uh, suspecting that you know, uh, they could be subject to some sort of unfounded uh, allegations. So uh, you know, hopefully, we will work toward one humanity and better future. So with that, I would like to conclude this panel. Thank you.